Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 194 of the MTG Goldfish podcast. It's Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and we have a super special podcast today. So Chris Van Meter couldn't be with us. Richard, of course, is here. How are you doing today, Richard? Hey, Seth. What's going on? Uh, not much. I'm excited for this one because we have a super special guest on our podcast today, and that is Mr. Reed Duke, one of the best Magic players, I think, in the world, at least in my opinion, uh, a very, very good Magic player. So, Reed, awesome to have you here. Why don't you uh, kind of introduce yourself? I'm sure most of our audience has probably heard of you, but in case some people have it, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Hey, Seth. Hey, Richard. Hey, everybody uh, listening. Um, first of all, I really appreciate that super nice introduction. That's that's really flattering, and um, it's pretty special for me to be on the podcast too. I'm a big fan of you guys. Uh, MTG Goldfish is just awesome resource for for players of pretty much any any level. I use it a lot. Um, but anyways, for those who don't know me, I uh, my name is Reed Duke. I've been full time professional Magic player for about four or five years now. I'm a content producer for ChannelFireball.com, and if you uh, follow the Pro Tour you may have run into either me or my teammates. I'm a member of Ultimate Guard Pro Team, who who, uh, were the reigning Pro Tour Team Series champions. And uh, more specifically, I'm a member of the Peach Garden Oath, the trio, along with Owen Turtonwald and William Jensen. Yeah, so uh, actually, I was going to ask you this later, but uh, since you mentioned Peach Garden Oath, how did that come about, Reed? Like, how have you known Owen and Huey for a long time? Or is that something that came about after you were a professional Magic player? Like, how did that start? Uh, well, actually, it came together somewhat organically. Um, I mean, I, I've kind of known Owen for a long time because we're we're like the same age. We're both American pro players. We worked together for the 2012 World Championships. And then Huey was uh, William Jensen. Huey, I call him Huey, but you know some people call him William. He he came back to the game after a hiatus for a handful of years. And when he came back, he joined my team, um, the Pantheon, which is full of like a lot of old school Hall of Famer type guys. John Finkel, who was a was a good friend of Huey um, since the old days. So Owen and Huey and I sort of linked up in that way. But you know we hit it off pretty early, and we started playing the team Grand Prix together. And we just, you know, became good friends. We learned a lot from each from each other uh, in terms of growing as Magic players. And if you want to know where the actual name, the Peach Garden Oath, came from, that's from uh, a novel called Three Kingdoms, or which has also spawned, you know, like a million television and movie and video game series, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, Dynasty Warriors. But uh, I- I'm really into it. And Huey saw me reading the book one time, and he's like, oh, I love that stuff. Like... <laughs> You know, Peach Garden Oath, and, you know, from there, it's just a natural evolution that, you know, since there are three of us, we should be the Peach Garden Oath. Yeah, that that is one of the coolest team names. Uh, I think it harkens back to a different time where, kind of now, team names are kind of serious. So Peach Garden Oath, I love the fact that people are like, oh, PGO, that sounds so cool. Uh, so, as you guys know, this podcast is sponsored by Spikes Academy. And Reed, I believe you have something special coming up on Spikes Academy, a modern course that's available for pre-order. Can you tell us about uh, what's happening on Spikes Academy uh, with yourself? Well, yeah, you said it, Richard. I've got a a modern course coming out on Spikes Academy on November 1st. It's uh, it's actually available for pre-order already, and you get a discounted price if you pre-order rather than waiting until the actual release on November 1st. But this is a project I'm really excited about. Spikes Academy is a is a cool new website. The, the first original teacher was Paulo Vitor Dama de Rosa, and I've I've watched his whole course. It, it's super helpful. Um, but the idea basically is that it is a complete um, self contained course featuring both lectures and examples, graphics, uh, workshops, quizzes, and you once once you purchase the course you you have it forever, so you could take it at your own pace, which is super helpful, I think, in uh, in in learning from magic content. Because just like with anything, if you sit down and you binge like twelve hours of of something in a row, you know, you read all the articles on ChannelFireball.com or all the articles on StarCityGames.com, that's great, but you're probably not going to retain all that information. So it's better, in my opinion, sit down, watch a little. You know, take your lunch break, digest, 
maybe do some examples, play a little bit and try to integrate what you learned and then go back and learn more. And, and taking that slower step-by-step -step approach is what's going to really allow you to, to take in the information and grow as a player rather than just having someone, you know, throw a million pieces of new information at you and just hope one or two of them stick. Uh, I think the model of Spikes Academy is really great where you can just buy the course and have it and take it at your own pace, review previous lessons if you didn't get something or just want a, a refresher. Um, so I'm pretty excited about the project and uh, my course is about the modern format in general coming out on November 1st. Yeah, I, I think Spikes Academy is really cool. Uh, Magic players spend a lot of money. We spend a lot of money, you know, going to pro tours, going to Grand Prix, getting hotels, buying decks, eating out, uh, and we spend a lot of time, you know, people watch tons and tons of content. They try to get, you know, the latest tips from pros and things like that. So it's a, it's a natural extension to, you know, have a focused learning environment. Like, you know, when you play football or baseball, you know, you do dedicated training. You don't just go play games and that's the only thing you do. If you want to get better and be serious about it, you do training. So I think it's pretty cool. We have a place to do that now. Now, Reed, you mentioned the course. Is it, how, what kind of player are you targeting? Like how, how experienced should I be? Is it for a new player? Is it for a PTQ grinder? What, what kind of player are you focused at? Well, it's not so much about the, the type of player that you are so much as the player that you want to be, that you're aspiring to be. And, you know, you use the, the football training camp analogy. Football training camp is not for everyone. If I just want to play a pickup game of football in my backyard and have some fun, I don't need to go to training camp. And, and just like that, Spikes Academy is, a niche product, not every Magic player has to purchase it, but if you're looking to be a competitive player to play in modern PPTQs, RPTQs, Grand Prix, maybe a Pro Tour someday, then it is going to be a great resource for you. So uh, one of my directives, one of the things that was really important to me when I was building the course is that players be able to take something from it no matter what level that they're starting with. So you know, whether you've never played a game of modern before, this could be a great resource for you as you'll get just a general breakdown of what the format's all about, what you can expect. Or if you are a experienced modern grinder already, there will still be, I hope, um, little nuggets of information, anecdotes, uh, examples that you can learn from a lot. I mentioned at the start that I watched Paulo's course on Spikes Academy, and I absolutely learned from it. I mean, Paulo is a player that he's so good, and just hearing his perspective, even if you have already developed your own opinions on these things, getting a new perspective, new ideas, um, and in, in introducing those into your game, it's super helpful. So uh, I tried to build this course in a way where it was it was general and overarching, but it's also from my perspective. I, I in talk a lot about my own experiences with modern. So don't think of it as like a textbook where it's going to be very dry and like, okay, these are the rules of the format. This is what's banned and this is what's legal. It's not like that. It's more of, I'm, you know, it's Reed Duke walking you through things and I'm, I'm sharing my experience with my many years of playing modern and the decks that I like and, you know, the way I approach sideboarding and everything like that. So, so you're getting a little bit of flavor in that sense. And I hope that players of any level can learn from it. So I'm curious, uh, how was the actual creation of the course? I know uh, the content itself, at least based on what I've seen from Paulo's course, it's a little different than the normal magic content, where mostly magic content, you either have people writing about decks or they're playing decks on Magic Online or Magic Arena or whatever. How challenging was it to kind of make this pretty unique style of content? We we're actually like more in a teacher mode than a gameplay mode. It was challenging and it, it was definitely not like a one take, like, boom, I got it perfect the first time, send it in. There was a lot of, you know, throwing things out, rewrites, re-recordings, brainstorming sessions with the guys from Spikes Academy. And it was only after all of that, that we really, we really nailed it. I think it, at, with the, with the finished product of, of, of what we wanted to achieve, because I started out and I sort of was being pretty dry. I was like lecturing into the camera and I was, I, I was wanted to be very general and like not ruffle any feathers and be fair to all the different decks and stuff like that. And that just wasn't really working. It wasn't exciting. It wasn't personal. 
so we we sort of worked out more that it would be a course from my perspective and and striking the right balance of of touching on all the different aspects of the format while also giving enough specifics that experienced players could learn from it. The directive that I started with was create a course about modern. And we all know that that's a tall order because modern is huge and there's so much to it. I mean, you could make, I could make an entire course about like turn one of a particular matchup of modern and, and there's a hundred decks in modern. So finding the balance of how general to be and how to cover uh, all the decks and all the important aspects of the format while also including these specifics where people can be like, oh, I never thought of that particular thing and, and walk away having learned something new. It, it was difficult to find the right balance and it took a lot of uh, of trying different things before we really found the best way. Yeah, that sounds really cool. So uh, it's available for pre-order right now on spikesacademy.com. It drops November 1st, the modern course by Reed Duke. Uh, that sounds really awesome. So I hope everyone should check that out. Uh, now, Reed, so we know you play Modern, obviously. We know you play Legacy, Standard. Do you play the more casual formats of Magic? Do you ever sling EDH? Do you play, I don't know, Two-Headed Giant? Do you ever play any of those more casual formats? Well, I'll start by saying that I love that stuff. I mean, I... It, it it almost it goes without saying that I just love magic and I'll engage with magic in, in basically any way that's possible. And I love being creative. I love playing with cards that I don't get to play with in, in super competitive Grand Prix Pro Tour formats. Um, but the catch is that I don't get an, as much time to play those formats as I like because so often when I'm firing up Magic Online or Arena, it's because I'm practicing for an upcoming tournament and there aren't Grand Prix and Pro Tours in, in Commander and in Popper and all these like really fun formats. Uh, I did, um, back in the day, my brother Ian and I built some Commander decks to play against, just, just play against each other. We didn't have a big group of friends to, to compete with at the time, but we were just like, you know, we'll play our favorite cards and we'll, we'll run up, up against each other. So, my brother built uh, a deck where his commander was Vendillion Click, and his deck was like sixty counter spells <laughs> and like thirty three <laughs> islands and you know whatever. And I ah, built a mono black guys. deck with with <laughs> braids, <laughs> where everything in my deck you know killed something or made the opponent discard. And we played like three or four games, and we're like, okay, I think we're missing the point of this format. Like, this is <laughs> this is not the way you're supposed to play commander. Um, but yeah, to, to get back to your original question, I love that stuff and I wish I had more time for it. But um, general, in general, most of my time with Magic is is spent competitively, you know, sadly, just because I, I have to look forward to upcoming tournaments and, and do my best. So you mentioned Magic Arena coming from kind of this competitive perspective. Uh, have you had a chance to play it? And what is your take on that as a, a way to maybe test for pro tours and play competitively? How's your experience with that, Ben? Uh, assuming you have tried it out. Okay, well, I have tried it out. And there's sort of two different parts to your question. The first is, what's my experience been with Arena? It's been great. I think Arena is awesome. It's really fast paced and user friendly. And it's kind of just fun, right? Like, I, I like the element of slowly building up your collection and, uh, you know, making your deck better and better. And as we mentioned a minute ago, getting to play with some cards that maybe are not at the 10 out of 10 competitive level, that's fun. It, it increases the scope of, of what you can engage with in Magic, and it, it's great. So I think Arena is super fun. I've had my friends that I played Magic with at age 12, you know, coming back to the game and messaging me being like, oh, Arena is so much fun, like help me with my deck. And that's just awesome. That really warms my heart. The second part of your question is, is do I see it as a way to practice for Pro Tours? And the answer is not yet. As long as Magic Online and Arena are both, you know, like heavily supported and I'm practicing for a tournament, I'm going to choose Magic Online because that has a lot more details and nuance that approximate the way you would play in a Grand Prix or a Pro Tour. And also, I would guess that it's it's a higher level of competition right now since Arena is is pulling in a lot of those newer players and, and beginners and stuff like that. So uh, for now, I think Magic Online and Arena are both super good, important tools. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue using both. Uh, I'm still 
pretty attached to Magic Online as a way to prepare for, for tournaments. Yeah, so so speaking of Arena, if they ever had high-stakes competition, so uh, let's say it's still best of one, but they gave higher prize support to compete with some of the other digital TCGs like uh, or CCGs like Hearthstone, uh, would you consider... Uh, switching over to that, like, what is what is your take? Are you a diehard paper magic player, or would you just play whatever the best EV or whatever the most popular, uh, you know, magic format is? Well, if I had to cut to the the essence of it, the bottom line, I would play whatever I believed was the highest level of competition. In in other words, the way that I can challenge myself the most within magic and play the most challenging game and face the most challenging competition. That's what I would do, and that's what I love about it. I do really love the paper Pro Tours because that's what I've grown up with, and that's sort of the pinnacle of magic in my mind. But I also really love new challenges. So if they were to come up with some kind of different format, like as you mentioned, the best of one uh, matches on Arena, that's that's just a new, a new puzzle, a new challenge to sink my teeth into, and I would have to learn as quickly as I could, how that changes the game of magic. And I would enjoy that. You know, I I would enjoy trying to come up with my best strategy for a tournament on arena in a, in a new kind of play environment. Actually, it sounds like that format might actually be relevant to you. Isn't that kind of similar to what the playoff, uh, the player of the year playoff is going to be the format for that? It is. It is. I think that's, that's really cool. And yeah, just to repeat what I said a minute ago, that's a new puzzle that I'm really excited to see what Seth Manfield and Luis Salvato do to approach this format. So if anyone hasn't read about it, it's the idea is that both players are going to bring four different standard decks for best of one matches, so no sideboarding, and you have to win one game with each of your four decks to be to be crowned the winner. So that's like a completely new puzzle. Do you just bring the best four decks that you have, or do you try to come with some kind of niche strategy and outguess what the opponent's going to do? So I think it's going to be super exciting, and I'll I'll be watching. You know, Thursday before the next Pro Tour, that'll be great. How do you feel as a competitor about that? Because, uh, you know, you all have been playing Magic the entire season with a particular format, which is, you know, best of three, you know, one of our normal formats, standard, modern. Uh, and then suddenly for playoff when everything is on the line, you're down to the last two people. And then Wizards throws you a curveball and gives you kind of this brand new format. Is that exciting or is that kind of a you know what are you doing wizards like we're not we're not this is not what we signed up for like where, where do you follow that uh well i'm sympathetic and i try to be positive because there are going to be possible complaints no matter what format they chose for the playoff right um and, and and i think some of the challenges with this format are number one it's a different format from the pro tour so you're you're challenging seth and luis to prepare for like a lot of different types of magic and bring, you know, not just their best deck for the pro tour, but, but four or five decks for, for this competition as well. And a corollary to that is I don't really like if a competition boils down to like, not how good you are, but who do you know and how many, you know, how big is your network? How many people can you have grinding games of standard to help you build your decks? That's not like really a fun part of, the game for me, so I, I hope that that is not the deciding factor for this playoff. But I do really like introducing new formats and challenging the players to think outside the box. And it'll be cool, I think, if if one of those guys comes with a really niche strategy that that the opponent hadn't thought of and maybe gets a little bit of a leg up due to like creativity and understanding the game of magic on a higher level. So it, there, there's both. I mean, there, there's there's valid complaints that you could make about the format, but I think it's going to be exciting just to throw the players into a new environment and, and see what they come up with. Yeah, I think from a viewer's perspective, it's definitely going to be exciting to see a whole bunch of different decks and maybe even some, I, I know from playing some on Arena, like the decks that are good without sideboards are sometimes different than the decks that you would play when you do have access to a sideboard and can like improve your bad matchups in games two and games three. So I think from a viewer's perspective, at least it should be a really interesting player of the year playoff so I'm definitely excited to check that out Uh, moving on from kind of digital stuff 
you're doing a modern class read on Spikes Academy, so we wanted to talk to you a little bit about the modern format. And first off, we had kind of one of our first big modern events, maybe the first big modern event, since we've had Guilds of Ravnica cards legal with the SCG Open this past weekend. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about the decks that seem to be performing well. And the first thing that kind of stuck out is, all of a sudden, everyone's playing Dredge. It's been like that on Magic Online. It was, I think Dredge was the most played deck on day two with the SCG Open. Uh, what is your take on the resurgence of Dredge in Modern? Mm. Well, you're referencing Creeping Chill from the new <laughs> format. I've been playing a bit of, of Modern on Magic Online, as I do have a Grand Prix coming up in, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. And I've been losing to Dredge a lot. There's there's no uh, <laughs> no sugarcoating it there. It's, it's a really, really good deck, and Creeping Chill does change the dynamic a bit. Uh, I, I'm a frequent like Jund, Abzan, Black Green player in Modern. And I've played the Dredge matchup a lot. And well, it's not a great matchup. It has come up for me in the past that I've just won games fair and square. You know, like you you thought sees one of their cards so that they're not as explosive and you get down to scavenging ooze and your Tarmogoyfs are big. And like you can sometimes just manage the situation if you're really careful with your your fair cards. And I think that's not true anymore with Creeping Chill. I think basically, like, starting the game at, what's it going to be, like, an 18-point life <laughs> deficit, um, effectively, <laughs> if you if you think the game's going to go long enough for them to, to mill approximately three of their creeping chills, that's just really hard to overcome with fair attacking and blocking, and, like, burn used to be a challenging matchup for Dredge, I think that that's probably changed quite a bit with creeping chill. So I think the deck is amazing, and I think we are getting back to that dynamic where it's like, do you want to pay the dredge tax? Do you want to come with, you know, four, five, six sideboard cards in order to have a good matchup against it? Or do you want to say, like, okay, I'll just lose if I play against a dedicated graveyard deck? And those are the those are the decisions that I think we're going to have to be making when we play Modern in, in the coming months. And those are decisions that are, like, especially challenging, I think, in Modern, where there's so many playable decks. Like, unlike Standard, where you can kind of, you're only fighting, like, a few main archetypes. In Modern, if you dedicate half your sideboard to beating Dredge, like, sure, you're going to beat Dredge, but how much are you giving up in all those other matchups? So do you think, is it practical, like, with your Jun deck read, like, can you pack enough graveyard hate to beat Dredge and still <laughs> not ruin all your other matchups? Oh, geez. Well, every... Every modern tournament that I play with Jund, I I go through the the list of decks and I'm like, okay, which of these do I want to win against and which of these do I want to lose against? And, you know, of course you never want, want to lose against a particular archetype, but as you said, like, everything's got to come from somewhere. So if I'm putting five anti-graveyard cards in my, in my sideboard then that's got to come out of the the Fulminator Mages that I have for Urzatron, or it's got to come out of the uh, Chokes that I have against Blue White Control, or it's got to come out of the Collective Brutalities that I get have against Burn. So you can't have it all. I mean, you can't just put two sideboard cards for every matchup and be like, okay, I'm all set. You have to actually make these choices and predict a little bit of, of what the metagame's going to be and know how the games are going to play out before and after sideboarding and, and make your best judgment calls. And sometimes you guess wrong, and, and it's not a great feeling. Like, the last modern tournament I, I played in, I played Abzan, and I was really, really gunning for blue-white control. I had two chokes in my sideboard, and I, I had good matchup against humans with lots of cheap removal and stuff. And then, yeah, I played against the, the Dredgevine deck twice and just got slaughtered because I hadn't packed enough graveyard hate. And it's like, did I do a bad job? Well... Maybe, but maybe I just got unlucky pairings. And sometimes it's it's just a numbers game. You just do the best with what you have. How do you feel about that aspect of modern? The fact that you really can't be anything. I know from watching some other pro players on social media and stuff, it seems like some people really dislike that aspect of modern, while other people view it more as a, a feature of the format, which makes modern unique from some of the other formats. Where do you fall on that scale as far as not really being able to be everything like you might be able to in standard? Well, variety is the spice of life, guys. I, I think one of the great reasons that Magic is such a good game is the variety of ways that you can engage with it. And I think you said it really well that this is 
this is an element of modern and it what it's what makes it different from standard you know if you want to show up and like kind of always play some spectrum of a mid-range mirror and every deck can beat every other deck then then standard is probably the format for you or maybe limited or whatever it might be but if you enjoy these really extreme matchups and decks that sort of break the mold and play magic in a much different way then that's why you would choose modern so yes it's kind of stressful as a pro player that there are going to be some elements that are out of my control and there are always going to be some bad matchups if I get the wrong pairings, but it's just what makes it fun. And I enjoy the puzzle, the problem solving and the, the, the stretching my limited resources as far as they will go. Uh, so I think modern's really cool. I really love the eternal formats personally, but what, what, what's great for one person is not great for another person. So just, there's all these different formats and, and, you can choose the ones that you enjoy the most. I don't think anyone's wrong to say that they're frustrated with modern, but I personally like it. Yeah. So I, I've heard a lot of people say that sideboard cards are too swingy in modern. And, you know, if you draw your sideboard card, you win. Like, for example, you get a rest in peace down versus dredge. You, you know, you're not guaranteed a victory, but you're off to a very, very good start. And you're very pleased as that player. What do you think about people who suggest either increasing or decreasing the sideboard slots to change that dynamic either going up to 20 or going down to 10 or maybe even best of one like what do you what do you think about that for you know quote unquote fixing or changing up modern well it sounds like playing with fire to me it's kind it kind of reminds me of like you know the time traveler who like goes back a hundred years and like <laughs> changes one thing and then the whole world is different like that would very very dramatically change the balance of power in modern if you change the sideboard size you know, my Jun deck with 20 sideboard cards would be way better. And your Dredge deck, when everyone else gets 20 sideboard cards, would be way worse. So I'm not going to say good or bad, but I'm just, I would just say like, if a change like that is ever made, be prepared for very extreme and unpredictable consequences. I would not, I would not make modern a best of one format. I think the sideboard is really important for the balance of power and uh, just like making the game fair because yeah. ex extreme strategies would be so powerful in a best of one environment. Yeah, I mean, a anything's possible. I'm open to anything, but but right now, the the number of sideboard cards being 15, that's a very important aspect of the modern format. Yeah, and it makes your deck construction and choices all that more important, right? Like what cards you want to keep, what cards you want to cut, because you have only 15 sideboard slots. Uh, so, so Reed, you are kind of the BGX master, Abzan, Jund. Uh, one of the most hype cards from Guilds of Ravnica was Assassin's Trophy. And this past weekend, we basically didn't see much of it. It didn't make much noise at all. What do you think of this card? Is it a staple of the format. Are you playing it in your Jun decks? All right. Well, you guys are going to get the exclusive scoop here because I have been asked this a lot of times since this card was first previewed, and I was I was being careful. I was reserving judgment. I didn't want to make like a like a first impression article for Channel Fireball because I want to actually play with it myself and learn about it and and, and have some quality and uh, authority behind what I say. But I have played with it now, and the first time I'll express my opinion it, it is coming right now. I think it is just okay. I think it's Ooh. I think it's not the savior of black green that many people want it to be. I don't think it automatically makes Tron a good matchup or anything like that. The thing is, the black green deck. The whole point of it is it runs on very thin margins, so you can't really afford to make an unfavorable exchange on turn two and still win most of those games. So, for example, one of the things that people really like about Assassin's Trophy is its flexibility. You could destroy a Search for Escanta or an Urza's Tower or a Leyline of Sanctity, whatever it might be. But I think if I blow up my opponent's, my blue-white control opponent's Search for Escanta on turn two with Assassin's Trophy, I'm losing that game most of the time just because the, the extra land matters a lot the games are very close and that's an unfavorable exchange. You know, it's effectively a one for zero. All I'm doing is slightly downgrading their card. So I don't think you really want to just jam four assassins trophies. And I don't think the strategy of trying to run the opponent out of basic lands with like the four field of ruin, four assassins trophy, four path to exile type 
versions. I don't think that's really a great strategy either. But I do think that having three answers to Teferi Hero of Dominaria instead of one is useful. I think having three answers to Leyline of Sanctity instead of one is useful. So I think Assassin's Trophy is just one more tool that you're going to mix in as a one or two or I mean maybe three of in your Jund or Abzan or Black Green deck. But I think you still have to have a diverse suite of removal and find the right tool for the right job. And, you know, I'm not putting my abrupt decays away anytime soon, if that makes sense. As a as a John player, Abzan player, Green Black X player, how do you feel about your archetype right now in modern? Like, is it a good time to be playing those decks? A bad time? A fine time? It's a mediocre time. Like we talked about, Dredge and Graveyard decks inherently are not a great matchup. And the nightmare scenario with John or Abzan is when you're being pulled really far in all all different directions at once. So. If I was going to play Jund at my next tournament, which I, I might, I mean, like, I, I still love the deck and I, I win with it sometimes, so this is going to be a strong consideration for me. I will probably be packing a lot of Graveyard Hate to try to combat the Dredge decks, but as we mentioned earlier, that comes from somewhere. It probably means fewer Fulminator Mages or fewer Collected Brutalities, so all this effort towards beating Dredge will weaken my deck on the whole. So in general, like the resurgence of Dredge is not good news and being pulled in a lot of different directions at once is not good news. I do think one of the decks to beat in modern is still blue-white or blue-white X control. And I think that can be a pretty good matchup for Jund and Abzan, especially if you're willing to play with Choke, which is just a, a an amazing, like, you know, instant KO type card for a matchup that goes long and you get to see a lot of cards. So I think Choke is, is a great reason to uh, be choosing one of these decks right now. So that's a little bit of a saving grace is like if I can just devote two sideboard slots and be pretty comfortable with one of the most important matchups, uh, a deck that's chosen by a lot of the, the really strong modern players that you can expect to gravitate towards the top of the standings. That's one thing that these decks have going for them. But, you know, you, you got your work cut out for you with, with so many different opponents that you're liable to face at, at a modern tournament. Yeah, so I'm a big fan of John. That's one of the reasons I love all your content. I always look up, what is Reduke doing with Jund? Uh, so if you're like me and you're wavering and you feel Tarmogoyf is not in a good spot, what kind of decks play like Jund but are better positioned for the meta? Well, one of the cards that I most want to play with for Grand Prix Atlanta is Jace the Mind Sculptor. I even tried out Sultai a bit on Magic Online just to have... You know, I was like, oh, Assassin's Trophy, Snapcaster Mage, and, you know, Jace the Mind Sculptor, Creepy Target. Like, these are all cards that I'm excited about. And I think Jace, well, naturally it does go in blue-white control, and that's one way That's one way to play it. But it's also just one of the most potent, like, sort of tap-out threats in the format. And lets you dig to your sideboard cards and have more answers to your one-ofs, you know, for whatever situation. So I think Jace is, is a really good... Um, Jund type of card if you want to play a fair tap out deck like Blue Moon or Teamer or a Jeskai Control or, or a Blue White Control. Those are all decks that you can sort of like side grade to if you're not comfortable with Jund. Um, I know that Gabriel Nassif has been playing with White Black mid range uh, on his, his stream, and that's a deck that seems to be showing some promise and has a lot of Jund esque aspects. And then I think the Collected Company decks are in a pretty decent spot too. That's that's one of the... Aside from, from Jund and Black Green X, Collected Company is the other category of like mid-range green deck where you can customize your list and you can have a lot of control over the way the games are playing and you can have game against a lot of different opponents. And I think those decks are pretty strong right now and you can play with Choke also, which is a card I'm pretty excited about. So uh, Collected Company is, is another way to go if you're not looking to play a really extreme strategy. So I wanted to move on and ask you some questions about organized play, but first, one last modern question, uh, just for my own curiosity, do you have a favorite modern deck that you know you can't play at GPs, you can't play at Pro Tours because it just like isn't going to get you there, but do you have a deck you really like to play but isn't quite there competitively? Soul Sisters? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, every time, like, I, I return to modern after a break, 
I'm like, all right, maybe it's going to be the time for Soul Sisters because <laughs> I'm really excited about uh, Windbrisk Heights is a card that I've loved like ever since it was first printed. I'm really excited about Archangel of Thune, which is a card that I just think is like incredibly powerful, but has has kind of rarely found the right home. But I mean, when Soul Sisters, like if you get the right matchup and things are going well for you and you're like, okay, mid combat, activate my Windbrisk Heights, put in an Archangel of Thune, double trigger my Soul Wardens, like all my guys are 10 tens and I'm at a hundred life. It's pretty sweet. I mean, you could do some awesome stuff against like other fair creature decks, but you know, if you run into too much storm combo or too many people with board sweepers, it's, it's frustrating. But that is a really sweet deck that one day, one day I'll bust it out. <laughs> uh, all right. So as far as organized play, we had a big organized play announcement that people were waiting for for a while with like finding out about more uh, pro tours next year, the GP schedule, Magic Fest weekends. Uh, what was just your overall impression of that announcement, Reed, as someone who's a pro player? So this uh, impacts you pretty directly. Overall, good. Uh, I mean, we like we could take it point by point because I think there's some some good and some bad and some frustrations and stuff like that. But overall, the you know the probably the biggest change is the the Grand Prix being Magic Fests now. I think that's an awesome change. Like Magic is not just for the pro players. It's not just for the highly competitive players. Magic is an amazing game because you can engage with it in such a wide variety of ways and. Some people like to go and trade their cards. Some people like to go and see the artists. Some people are going just to have the excitement and be part of everything and, you know, see the cosplayers and stuff like that. And that's great. Like, I think you should come to Grand Prix even if you don't want to play in the main event and you don't have aspirations of getting to the Pro Tour. Like, and I think Magic Fest is a step in the right direction where there's just a wider range of offerings. There's more excitement and it's, it's just more multidimensional. It's not all about the Grand Prix tournament. So one question I had as far as the Magic Fest weekends is part of that announcement was Pro Tours moving forward. Uh, there's going to be more of them, which is kind of another topic, but Pro Tours are going to be held at Magic Fest weekends, which will also have Grand Prix. So as someone who's going to be playing the Pro Tour, Reed, uh, what do you think about this? Is it nice to have an audience around cheering you on? Is it distracting to have 5,000 people at your Pro Tour? From the Pro perspective, what do you think about kind of the mismatch of Pro Tours and GPs being together now? Well, if I'm just giving like my own personal sort of self-serving answer, I would say that's the change that I am not that happy with. The, the, the Pro Tours as they stand right now have this kind of like nice like serene intimate environment where it's like pretty quiet and everyone's like taking it seriously and there's like a high level of mutual respect and stuff like that and that's pretty cool for me it makes it different from a big tournament like a grand prix or a star city games open or something like that so we're gonna lose that like intimate quiet environment and there's gonna be a lot more like hecticness and a little bit harder to get you know like quiet space to yourself at the pro tours but that's okay. I mean, that's like a sacrifice that, that might be worth making just to have allow more people to in engage with the Pro Tours. And I do think it's really cool to have the live studio audience. Like, I, I always think it's awesome when people are playing their top eight matches at the Pro Tour and there's like an auditorium seating of all the people that are there just to watch them. And then the winner comes out with the trophy and there's like a hundred people applauding and stuff like that. That's, that's a really cool feeling. That's something that I love about magic. And that will be even expanded upon now that pro tours are at magic fest weekends. Yeah. So we're going to get more fans at these events uh, with magic fest happening. If there's a certain pro player, a fan wants to meet, you know, maybe get an autograph, shake their hand, take a picture. How, how do you, how do you feel that should be done? Cause I know, you know, some people kind of go over the top, you know, they stalk you into the bathroom mm. and, you know, they try to meet that. That's probably inappropriate. But if you're just sitting there at the event, is it okay to come up and approach you or, you know, how, how should we handle these situations? Yeah, it's totally okay to come up and approach. I'm, I'm glad you asked this question. Um, pro players, like I'm speaking for myself, but I think this goes for, for a lot of content producers and, and pro players. 
we are super happy to meet someone who's read our stuff or watched us play and, and, and you know, wants to say hello and introduce themselves. That's awesome. That's like what I live for. Um, so definitely like, please, if you want to meet me or, or come like chat, have it like autograph a picture, please find me at these weekends. Just uh, do it when we're not in a match. And, you know, like a, a lot of times if I'm one of the last matches playing, I'll draw a crowd of people like waiting to talk to me after the match, which is good. Like people are, are very respectful in that sense, but you know, sometimes it, it, you, you need that like short time to, to breathe after a match is over. Like I want to be able to shake my opponent's hand and pack up my stuff and sign the match slip and everything like that before people like jump in and, and, and engage with me. So I'm sort of rambling, but basically the concept is just be respectful that like we are there to compete in the tournament so the in-match time needs to not be disrupted, but any time between matches, like if you catch us, you know, waiting online to get some food or like just sitting in a corner by ourselves or even talking with a group of our friends, like that's fine. We we want to we want to meet you. Just do it in a respectful way and sort of run it through the filter of like, is it okay if 100 or 200 people were doing the same thing that I'm doing? So so what I mean by that is like, if you want to come up, introduce yourself, get an autograph, get a picture. Awesome. Like that stuff is great. I want as many people to do that as possible. If you want to come up and challenge me to a game of modern or like ask for help with your sealed deck or something like that, that's fine also. But just realize that I'm going to be able to sometimes say yes and sometimes say no, because there's only so many hours in a day. And if everyone was coming up and challenging me to a game of modern, it, it would be too much, you know? So like that, that's something that I'll do when I have the free time and and am able to do it but you know sometimes i'll have to respect respectfully decline yeah so if you just run it through that filter of like what if everyone asked for this then you'll you'll never go wrong well said so i'll, I'll put you on the spot here what is your most memorable fan interaction <laughs> well geez i mean it was super special for me when i was younger and i was first getting my start to go to a tournament and meet someone who was like reed i watched you play online like at the last pro tour like read i read your article and it helped me and it like influenced the way i was building my deck like that was just awesome and uh i don't know that i could pull like a really specific one interaction from my brain you know on the fly on the fly right now but just like the the, the early days of when i when i was first starting to feel like my presence in magic was influencing other people that was just super special and i still remember it to this day and it's it's part of what's you know driven me to to continue producing content and being the best player i can be and, and trying to set a good example and stuff like that yeah so speaking of the early days how has competitive magic changed since you know when you first started versus now because nowadays we have twitter you know we have reddit social media uh you know you have magic online to test and things like that how you know what what are the differences that kind of, you know, us observers and fans might not realize have, have happened to the competitive scene? Well, I guess the way that the, the Pro Tour players engage with Magic has changed a lot. Like, 10 years ago, there weren't really full-time professional Magic players. Like, my job did not exist 10 years ago. And it exists now because Magic has grown quite a lot and people are engaging with the content more and I can make my living by writing and creating courses on Spikes Academy, whatever it might be. So that's different. And the way that people prepare for Pro Tours has changed along with that. So in the old days, there was like Team Channel Fireball uh, with, you know, Luis Scott Vargas and Josh Utter Layton and all those guys, Ben Stark. And that was like the big magic team and there weren't really necessarily parallels or competitors to that team in other parts of the world like sure you know every once in a while people would beat up and, and practice together but there wasn't like a sponsored concerted team that did what they did every single pro tour and similarly when i joined the pantheon we were we were preparing for the pro tours in a different way than our competitors were. And, and I, I think it showed it in the early days that we had this big advantage. Like a lot of times we'd come with a great deck and be really well prepared and do well in draft and everything like this. But now the, the loving, the playing field is more leveled. There are, there are teams everywhere in every part of the globe 
there's a bunch of different pro American magic teams that are all like highly competitive with one another. There's not one team that you can point to and be like, they are the best, you know, like they beat everyone else every time that that doesn't exist anymore. It's, it's highly competitive. Um, and it's relatively even everyone's doing it or everyone that, that is taking magic as seriously can as they can is on one of these big testing teams. Um, separately moving on to another point, the cards are available earlier now. So most of my experience with the pro tours is like the cards are released and then the pro tour is one week later or two weeks later. So it's, it's like a race for who can process the new information as quickly as possible. And that's one of the reasons that these big teams used to have such a large advantage, but now the cards are out on magic online. Sometimes the pro tours aren't until later in the season. So it's, it's more like everyone has ask, access to the information. So your approach needs to be either I'm going to come up with something special that no one's thought of, or I'm just going to do the best, tightest job with one of the established decks. So yeah, the, the world is changing. And I think for the better, I like when it's as competitive as possible and where everyone has the resources they need to prepare if they're willing to put in the time and hard work. So, um, you know, even though I'm not enjoying this huge leg up on the field anymore due to being on a professional testing team, I think it's better for the game. Well, since we're talking organized play and changes, I got to ask you, uh, we had Worlds like a month ago, and one of the big topics to come out of Worlds was Jerry Thompson deciding not to play in the event because of uh, some concerns about organized play. So uh, do you have any thoughts on worlds and uh and jerry thompson's uh protest i guess you would say at worlds yeah well i've known jerry i've been friends with jerry for many years and i've always respected him as someone who's willing to stand up for for his values and that remains true even in the cases where his values don't 100 percent align with my values and in terms of like well if the question is do i support jerry absolutely i think he made a sacrifice that I would be unable to make, like plain and simple. I could never do what he did. And I really, really support and respect what he did. And I hope something good comes out of it. In terms of, do I agree with Jerry? You know, yes and no, we'd have to go point by point for, for the, the, the issues that he brought up. But um, I think, you know, I'm glad to have Jerry in my corner as, as, uh, as a player. And I, I'm glad that he is, standing up for what he believes in. And I really, really, really hope with all my heart that that uh, positive changes come from from what he did. Yeah, all, all of these issues seem to be around, you know, having a career in magic and assuming magic is around for, I don't know, five, 10, 15 more years. Uh, do you see yourself continuing down this path or do you are you going to retire at some point and live a quote unquote normal life or do you feel your you know magic is in your blood and you need to play it for as long as the game is around? Uh, well, Richard, I, I've never really been one for planning for the future, so uh, I don't know really. Um, I, I've never like at no point in my life was I like, did I say I'm going to be a professional magic player forever? Like that's going to be my career. So I am, you know, like at some point something might happen where I'm not good enough anymore or I'm not enjoying it anymore or the game, you know, takes a certain turn and like I'm prepared to do something else with my life, but I love magic and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to stay with it for as long as I continue loving it. So there's definitely no plans for retirement in, in my immediate future. I, I love playing the Pro Tours. And I'll continue playing the Pro Tours for as long as I am allowed to. I am also looking for more different ways to engage with Magic. Uh, I've been doing coverage now and again, which I really enjoy. I am, you know, made this course for Spikes Academy and I'm still producing a lot of content. So I don't know if like the Grand Prix and Star City Games Open grind is going to be the same for me. 10 years from now, but I still love competing at the highest level. I still love magic and I'm, I'm going to, it's going to continue to be a big, big part of my life for the foreseeable future. I just said, uh, you just mentioned coverage. And so, so far we've heard, uh, about, you know, Reed Duke, the player, the competitor, uh, Reed Duke, the teacher on Spikes Academy. But earlier this year at Grand Prix Richmond, we saw Reed Duke, 
the commentator. So how how was that experience for you? Uh, you know, being a player, a commentator, and being shadowed kind of the entire event. Oh wow! Well, uh, Grand Prix Richmond was definitely a rush for anyone who didn't catch it. This was um, it was a, a dual Grand Prix weekend, right? So Friday, Saturday, Legacy, Saturday, Sunday, Standard, and I was a member of the coverage team. Like I was doing some commentary in the booth and providing pre-recorded content to be shown over the course of the weekend. But I also competed in the legacy grand prix and they, they featured effectively all of my matches. So that was super exhausting, intense weekend to, uh, I mean, competing in a grand prix tournament is already a really like trying, exhausting endeavor. Right. And then uh, on top of that, having to, Instead of having like downtime and going to get a bite of eat or going for a walk, I would just go straight to the coverage booth after my round finished. So it was a lot less downtime, a lot less recharge time, a lot more like go, 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 you know, have this sort of marathon endurance. But I love it. I mean, I, I really like I got to have my cake and eat it, too, in the sense that I got to compete in a Grand Prix in my favorite format, which is Legacy. And I got to be part of the excitement the whole weekend being in the coverage booth. So I have no regrets. It was just super awesome. So you did pretty well at the GP. I don't remember what your exact record was, but you were in uh, contention for the top eight or uh, close to it through most of the event. Did you feel like uh, it was harder to do well with the gameplay where you had to do all this rushing around and coverage in between? Like, do you think your gameplay suffered at all with just the hecticness of the weekend? Um, It's hard for me to say. I was relatively happy with the way I played that weekend, although for a format as complex as Legacy, there's not really such a thing as perfection. Like, I, there's always things that you could go back and say, I could have done this better. I don't think my gameplay suffered in any kind of, like, tangible way that we could put our fingers on. There was a little bit of, like, information disadvantage since I was on camera every single round and like my sideboard was being shown and my sideboard plans and stuff like that. And I even had one, actually the, the, the opponent that knocked me out of comp, top eight contention after the match, we were doing the sort of like post match debrief chat. And he was like, yeah, I saw when you played against team or Delver earlier that you like, sh I saw the way you sideboarded when you were on camera and I, I brought in, my ancient grudge to beat your ensnaring bridge and stuff like that. So that's like sort of a concrete advantage where, or sort of a concrete example of where the information disadvantage may have, may have translated to, to an actual in match disadvantage, but that's okay. I mean, I knew that, that, that was what I was signed up for. And as I said, I, I had no regrets. Like I think the benefit of being able to both compete and be on the coverage team and the good feeling that I got for having put on a good show and the, the people that have supported me and came up to me after the fact and told me how much they enjoyed it. Like, that's all been just totally worth it. You, you did mention, Seth, uh, I was, my record was 11 and two with two rounds to go. So if I had won that, if I had got that 12th win, I might've been able to draw and be in the top eight. But as it was, I lost that round and then got an unintentional draw in the final round. So the end of the tournament was like pretty disappointing for me on a personal level, but that was tempered by the fact that I got to say, yeah, like I was, I was in it right till the end. We put on a great, exciting show and people seemed to like it at home. So that, that definitely took some of the sting out of it for me. Yeah, it was great to watch at home. I know uh, social media was super excited. Everyone was talking about it. So thank you for doing it because it made a really entertaining event. And I'm sure it has to be a lot more work and just busyness on your end. So it was super awesome uh, to get to watch from home. That was for sure. Anyway, I think that brings us to the end of episode 194 of the MTG Goldfish podcast. So Reed, thank you so much for joining us. It was awesome to get to chat with you today. Yeah, it was awesome being here. Thanks so much for, for inviting me to join you. Uh, and a reminder, Reed is a professor over at SpikesAcademy.com. They sponsored the show. Check them out over at Spikes Academy. You can even get 10% off if you use the cold goldfish. So thank you to Spikes Academy for the support. Richard, as always, thanks for hanging out. Thanks to everyone for listening. So that does it for today. Have a wonderful week, everyone, and we will talk to you soon.